Oh, well, are we going to just let pedophiles speak? And it's like, no, they already founded the church. <laughs> <laughs> because reading Jack Wayland wasn't depressing enough. <laughs> well, we're here today. <laughs> <laughs> We're here today uh, on a more solemn note than Tanner's outfit might suggest, depending <laughs> on how you look at it. We obviously had to read Jeffrey R. Holland's new, uh, was it, a, yeah, Address to BYU. I've seen Mormons complaining about it, and I feel like that's always, that's how you know that someone really fucked up. It sucks. I grew up, like, obsessed with, like most Mormons, who saw the one <laughs> eloquent... Uh, Fist intellectual, pumping. yeah, passionate yeah. orator in the church, and being like, "Oh yeah, I feel the spirit because mm-hmm. he's so powerful." And it's like, "He's just like a it's like no, we just speaker. would talk to associate meanness and like toxic men with the spirit." Honestly, the pit bull of the Lord. Someone made a tweet. It's at Megs and Alien on Twitter. The Holland being your favorite apostle back in the day to Holland aiming at you with a musket pipeline. <laughs> It's real. That reference will become clear if you don't know. So this was given August 23rd, 2021. It's called The Second Half of the Second Century. It's a very sexy title. Someone once told me that the young speak of the future because they have no past, while the elderly speak of the past because they have no future. Although it damages that little aphorism, I come to you as the veritable ancient of days to speak of the future of BYU but a future anchored in our distinctive past. Oh, I wonder what kind of past Mormonism (laughs) is anchored into. Should be enlightening. Let's look back a couple decades and see what they were all about. (laughs) (laughs) What's the veritable... He said, I come to you as the veritable ancient... He's making a joke about how old he is. Oh, okay, fine. Uh, If I have worded that right, it means I can talk about anything I want. <laughs> really sounds like someone who's struggling being oppressed and having their freedom of speech denied. Don't give spoilers. <laughs> Spoiler alert. Mormonism having an oppression complex is hardly. I'm grateful that the full university family is gathered today, faculty, staff, and administration. Regardless of your job description, I'm going to speak to all of you as teachers because at BYU, that is what all of us are. Thank you for being faithful role models in that regard. I can't be certain, but I think that it was in the summer of 1948 when I had my first BYU experience. I would have been seven years old. We were driving back to St. George from one of our rare trips to Salt Lake City. As we came down Old Highway 91, I saw high on the side of one of the hills a huge block white. White and bold and beautiful. Mm. White and bold and beautiful. You probably want to stay away from that language. I'm surprised you didn't say white and (laughs) delightful. I know, you had to edit some of that shit out of your own scriptures. Maybe just keep it on there. 1948 that's like the dark ages truly i think about like the 50s any before the 60s was a really scary time it was just like full on military industrial uh, complex Mm -hmm. like we exist to breed soldiers to fight for america like just a weird weird time pre-civil rights movement pre-sexual liberation nuts i don't know how to explain that moment but it was a true epiphany for a seven-year-old If I had seen that why on the drive up or any other time, I couldn't remember it. But I saw it that day, and I believe it was a revelation from God. It's literally just a thing you saw. (laughs) You just saw someone deface a mountain. (laughs) God put the mountain there, not the why. I somehow knew that bold letter meant something special. It can't have been because your parents in the car were like, look, little Jeff. Actually, they were probably way more harsh than that. Yeah. (laughs) You're picking up on your parents' energy about it. It should have prompted the question... Why? (laughs) I somehow knew that the bold letter meant something special and that it would one day play a significant role in my life. When I asked my mother what it meant, she said it was an emblem of a university. Just some old university. (laughs) I thought about that for a moment and then said quietly, well, it must be the greatest university in the world. What other university would put a Y on a mountain? You know, humans are very bad at memory, and with every telling of a story, it gets distorted. False memories are a huge thing. Maybe little seven-year-old Jeff thought it would be the greatest university in the world with no context around the fact that it was God's God's true university, but mm, I don't find that story particularly compelling. Not at all. (laughs) Whatever. My chance to actually get on campus came in June 1952, four years after that first sighting. That summer, I accompanied my parents to one of those early leadership weeks, a precursor to what is now the immensely popular education week held on campus. That means I came here for my first BYU experience 69 years ago with a preview of that four years earlier. 
If anyone in this audience has been coming to this campus longer than that, please come forward and give this talk. I wish someone would have just stood up <laughs> and been like, okay. Otherwise, sit still and be patient. Ah, yes, the old telling the young they have nothing to offer <laughs> because they're younger. As Elizabeth Taylor said to her eight husbands, I won't be keeping you long. I don't know the reference. Is it, I, I think he's just trying to be funny. My point, dear friends, is simply this. I have loved BYU for nearly three-fourths of a century. Only my service in and testimony of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, including my marriage and the beautiful children it has given us, has have affected me as profoundly as has my decision to attend Brigham Young University. In so testifying, I represent literally hundreds of thousands of other students who say the same thing. Okay, so he's basically just establishing that he has the biggest boner for BYU in the room. Mm -hmm. He was president of BYU. So for legions of us over the years, I say, thank you for what you do. Thank you for classes taught and meals served and grounds so well kept and so well watered in times of drought. Thank you for office hours and lab experiments and testimony shared, gifts given to little people like me so we could grow up to be big people like you. Thank you for choosing to be at BYU because your choice affected our choice. And like Mr. Frost's poetic path, that has made all the difference. He loves the literary references, doesn't he? He does. It gives him credibility. I know. I will say that, I mean, we went to BYU, Idaho, and there's definitely still teachers that I have so much love for. Oh, yeah. Like, <clears throat> that are so I much mean, better yeah. than the institution. Yeah, and the university you choose obviously does have a profound impact on the course of your life. Mm -hmm. I asked President Worthen for a sample of the good things that have been happening of late, and I was delighted at the sheaf of items he gave me. Small type, single space lines, everything from academic recognitions which hopefully they're about to lose, <laughs> and scholarly rankings to athletic success and the reach of BYU TV. Carl G. Mazer would be as proud as I was. Who's that guy? I have no idea, but BYU TV, someone made a tweet today that was like, uh, hey, I worked for BYU TV. Our, like, the greatest reach we ever had was like ten to 20,000 viewers yeah. and like the only success we've had was Studio C. Like nobody watches BYU yeah, TV. Yeah, there's no even way Even though they've dumped millions of dollars into uh -huh. it. They're not expanding their reach. I've seen the billboards in I-15 but it's like even Mormons don't want to watch BYU oh. TV. I did as a teen. <laughs> <laughs> I downloaded those episodes. So dumb. But Kevin and I both know those aren't the real success stories of BYU. These are rather, as some of our of ordinances in church, outward signs of an inward grace. I thought it was commitment. He's changing shit on me. <laughs> the real successes at BYU are the personal experiences that thousands here have had. Personal experiences difficult to document, categorize, or list. Nevertheless, these are so powerful in their impact on the heart and mind that they have changed us forever. Sometimes in truly traumatic ways, ask anyone who went through BYU's conversion therapy program. I run a risk in citing any examples beyond my own, but let me mention just one or two. One of our colleagues seated here this morning speaks of his first semester pre-mission enrollment in my friend Wilford Griggs' History of Civilization class. But this was going to be civilization seen through a BYU lens. <laughs> cool. I see everything through my because BYU lens. Because the actual history of civilization <laughs> is, is not in alignment with the church's truth claims. As no, you need a special know. lens for that. The BYU lens. So as preambles to the course, Wilf had, re had the students read President Spencer W. Kimball's second century address and the first chapter of Hugh Nibley's Approaching Zion. Good thing they only read the first chapter, because if they persisted through the rest of that book, they would have been converted to socialism, because <laughs> Hugh Nibley was a straight-up socialist. It's, uh, he gave a talk called uh, Leaders and Managers that was basically just like, religious hierarchies really suck and have no inspiration and do like all oh, perpetuate yeah. all the bad problems it's like genuine leaders who are outside the hierarchy who don't identify as the managers who are actually doing shit damn do you anyway, have the, the last sip of this coffee yes taken together our very literate friend says these two readings forged an indestructible union in my mind and heart between two soaring ideals that of a consecrated university with that of a holy city Zion, I came to believe, would be a city with a school, and I would add a temple, creating something of a celestial college town, or perhaps a college kingdom. But the idea of kingdom freaks me out. I know. Because this is a I guy know. who claims to be an apostle of Jesus Christ, who has never spoken with Jesus, because, know. you know, reason, obvious reasons. Holy cities freak me out in general. King, like, it, it seems so like a midwife, what's that tale, uh, a handmaid's tale, mm -hmm. like that idea of like... Uh, this conservative, theocratic yeah, government. Yeah, a holy city, like, how is it not going to be theocratic? And then how is it not going to be coercive and abusive? Like After his mission, our faculty friend returned to Provo where, where, where he fell under the soul-expanding spell of John Tanner. 
love to be under a soul expanding <laughs> spell. How do I find a witch to put one of those on me? <laughs> I don't trust the name. The platonic ideal of a BYU professor, superbly qualified in every secular sense. Totally, <laughs> already a contradiction. What does the platonic ideal mean? I can't tell if he's talking about Plato, which seems to have oh. nothing to do with this. Um, totally committed to the kingdom and absolutely effervescing with love for the savior, his students, and his subject. He moves seamlessly from careful teacher analysis to powerful personal testimony. Who knew, he knew scores of passages from Milton and other poets by heart. Yet verses of scripture flowed, if anything, even more freely from the abundance of his consecrated heart. That's too bad. You remember, like, reading, like, good writing after Mormonism and being like, why did I think that yeah. all that tripe was so good? I literally so was much just like, this sounds stuff. old, and so I just assumed it was inspiring. <laughs> <laughs> you say anything in, a, in 13th century mm-hmm. English, it sounds profound. And you're like, damn. I am shooketh. I was unfailingly edified by the passion of his teaching and the eloquence of his example. Why would such an, such an one come to teach at BYU after a truly distinguished postgraduate experience? That might well have taken him to virtually any university in America. Because, our colleague says, in a coming day the citizens of Zion shall come forth with songs of everlasting joy. I hope, he writes, to help my students hear that chorus in the distance and to lend their own voices in time to its swelling refrain. Such are the experiences we hope to provide our students at BYU, though probably not always so poetically expressed. Then, imagine the pain that comes with a memo like this one I recently received. These are just... Oh, oh, here we go. We're getting into it. These are just a half dozen lines from a two-page document. You should know, the writer says, that some people in the extended community are feeling abandoned and betrayed by BYU. It seems that some professors, at least the vocal ones in the media... The are media! S- <laughs> the <whoa. laughs> ...are supporting ideas that many of us feel are contradictory to gospel principles making it appear to be about like any other university our sons and daughters could have attended. Several parents have said they no longer want to send their children here or donate to the school. Ding, 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 ding. We're afraid of losing money. (laughs) Ain't that always it? Please don't think I'm opposed to people thinking differently about policies and ideas the right to continue. I do think that, actually. (laughs) I do think that higher education is a tool of Satan and is, you know, ultimately just a weapon of the left-wing pedophilic cabal that runs our country. Of but course. I don't want to say I'm against contrary opinions. I just want to say that you're not allowed to think differently than me. <laughs> I, why can't you reconcile that? But I would hope that BYU professors would be bridging those gaps between faith and intellect. Oh, honey, they can't. <laughs> so cute that you think they can. And would be sending out students that are ready to do the same in loving, intelligent, and articulate ways. Yet, I fear that some faculty are not supportive of the church's doctrines and policies and choose to criticize them publicly. There are consequences to this. Are you threatening me (laughs) in your letters? There are consequences to this. After having served a full-time mission and marrying her husband in the temple, a friend of mine recently left the church. In her graduation statement on a social media post, she credited such and such a BYU program and its faculty with the radicalizing of her attitudes and the destruction of her faith. Oh, God. Yeah, so a lot of people say that BYU um, radicalized them or destroyed their faith because, I mean, there are good teachers at BYU and, and there obviously is a lot of truth and, like, facts and evidence that is incompatible with Mormonism's truth claims. So, like, yeah. Like, getting getting more educated is a lot of the time going to be pretty harmful to one's faith in Mormonism. Yeah, it's not necessarily the professors. It's the act of, like, expanding your learning yeah. and le- learning to think critically yeah. of holding to contrary opinions. I'd say BYU-Idaho, not so much, but I feel like at BYU there's a bit more of, like, real academic rigor than there was at BYUI. Also, I think the better word than radicalizing is normalizing. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. I, I, you know, at BYU-Idaho, I... I took a course on global warming because I was like, I don't know anything about this yet. I have, I am supposed to have really strong opinions about this and I know nothing about it. So let me learn about it. And then I did. And during the course of that thing, it was like, okay, this is definitely real. Like in every way that we can observe in across all branches of science, everyone's in agreement. This is happening. And so the teacher couldn't be like, well, this isn't necessarily true. Mm -hmm. He was just like, "Eh, yeah, it is. Even though our church leaders and others kind of shy away Mm -hmm. from talking about it, it's definitely going on. So it wasn't like the teacher radicalizing me. It was just like, just showing me how things are. And it was contrary to the, to the general feelings of Mormonism. Also, we should stop calling it BYU and start calling it by its official name, BYU-Idaho Provo. (laughs) (laughs) 
Um, mm. Yeah, I mean, like, you, the climate change is a, thing is a good example because climate change skepticism doesn't really exist in Europe in the way that it does here. Like, you mm. don't... I had never met a climate change skeptic in England. But it is, like, this uniquely American thing because in America, climate change is associated with being left... Like, believing in it or caring about it is associated with being left-wing mm. because you know the well the left and the right are in the pocket of big oil but like the right more so mm. and it's like more of a thing that democrats care about obviously republicans are denying that it's a it's a thing that we need to be worried about so then that gets conflated with like you're you're radicalizing our students to be part of antifa or mm. whatever you know but it's just like all of that logic is absurd it shouldn't mm. be political it's just become political because there's one side that is more invested in suppressing the truth and that goes across all these things that could potentially be radicalizing students, like right. gender studies or right. uh, Just history. Just like having empathy for people who aren't, you know, yeah. I mean, there's so much. It's reminiscent of Boyd K. Pactor, Packer's uh, comments about historians, that their problem is they idolize the truth. <laughs> <laughs> Fortunately, we don't get many of those letters, but this one isn't unique. Several of my colleagues get the same kind, with most of them ultimately being forwarded to poor President Worthen. I actually do poor President poor little Worthen. President. <laughs> I just think it is really interesting because I do feel like since Trump took office and like since all the Trump stuff began, it's really become clear that for a lot of Mormons, like political affiliation now is it trumps their religious affiliation. Like we've seen that in members of the church saying like not believing that the prophet is inspired for saying like wear a mask and get vaccinated mm. suddenly they're doubting the church because their perceived identity is more wrapped up in their political affiliation than the church which is a switch because it never used to be like that i feel like mm. the church used to have such a stronghold on people's psyches in that respect so i can totally imagine these conservative parents sending their kids to byu because like they're mormon and that's that i mean byu is still an extremely conservative option but then they're, they're pissed off because their kids are learning about climate change and do you know what I mean? Yeah. You can totally imagine them writing those kinds of letters. Oh yeah. Now, most of what happens on this campus is wonderful. That is why I began as I did with my own undying love of this place. But every so often we need a reminder of the challenge we constantly face here. Here's what I said on the subject exactly 41 years ago, almost to the day. I had been president for all of three weeks. I said then and I say now that if we are an extension of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, taking a significant amount of sacred tithes and other precious human resources, all of which might well be expanded, expended in other worthy causes, surely our integrity demands that our lives be absolutely consistent with the characteristic of the restored gospel of Jesus Christ. And at a university, there will always be healthy debate regarding a whole syllabus full of issues. But until we all come to the unity of faith and have grown to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, our next best achievement will be to stay in harmony with the Lord's anointed, hmm. those so whom he has designated <laughs> to declare church doctrine and guide Brigham Young University as its I trustees. I hate when apostles do this. They're like barely concealing the fact that they're like, you need to listen to me. What I say is true. What uh -huh. I say goes. It's so cringe. Especially when they brand it as the gospel of Jesus Christ, because the Mormon church is really like if you took every declarative statement that Jesus made uh -huh. about religion and then did it the exact uh -huh. opposite. It's like, oh... Uh, Jesus criticized people who wanted to be have the chief seats and be addressed by their titles and wear their fancy clothes and look down on people who had uh, been kicked out of the religion. Like, that's the worst thing that you can be. And the Mormon church is like, wait, but what if we did exactly that and called ourselves the, the church it's of Jesus when Christ? We do it. <laughs> also, do you really want people uh, thinking that their best achievement is to stay in harmony with the Lord's anointed when, like, every few years you're having to disavow more and more stuff that past <laughs> members of the Lord's anointed have said. With the church growing more rapidly in the less prosperous countries, we must conserve sacred funds more carefully than ever before. That's why we're buying the whole of Florida. <laughs> <laughs> we need the real estate or else. <laughs> At BYU, we must ally ourselves even more closely with the work of our Heavenly Father. A college education for our people is a sacred responsibility, but it is not essential for eternal life. Especially for women. I know, I was thinking that. <laughs> a statement like that gets my attention, particularly because just a short time later, President Nelson chairs our board, holds our purse strings, and has the final yay or nay on, on every proposal we make from a new research lab to more undergrad study space to approving a new pickup for the physical facility staff. Russell M. Nelson is very, very good at listening to us. It might be good to start listening to some people, other people. 
For once. Maybe. That'd be cool. Three years later, 2017, Elder Dallin H. Oaks, not then but soon to be in the first presidency, where he would sit only one chair, one heartbeat away <laughs> from the same position President Nelson has now, not hero worship, <laughs> quoted our colleague Elder Neil A. Maxwell, who had said, in a way... <laughs> Why didn't he just quote Elder Maxwell? Why is he like... I know. Elder it's just Oaks. trying to circle jerk every apostle we can, honestly. <laughs> I really just feel like it's like if I can cur- They probably have to vote on stuff in the apostle, mm. so it's like good to get people on your side. He's not quoting Oopdorf, that's all I'm saying. <laughs> in a way, Latter day Saint scholars at BYU and elsewhere are a little bit like the builders of the temple in Nauvoo, who worked with a trowel in one hand and a musket in the other. Today, scholars building the temple of learning must also pause on occasion to defend the kingdom. I personally think Elder Maxwell went on to say, this is one of the reasons the Lord established and maintains this university. The dual role of builder and defender is unique and ongoing. I'm grateful we have scholars today who can handle, as it were, both trowels and muskets. Oh yeah, your scholars are doing that? Yeah, the the taper the horse? Yeah, good old musket you got there. I just, BYU is not under attack like it's a private (laughs) university it can just to state the obvious like it can essentially do what it wants like it's allowed to be homophobic it's allowed to like expel students for having sex don't forget that byu was deeply persecuted by the government and threatened to have their accredit their accreditation removed and their and to be kicked out of the athletic programs just for a little bit of racism just for some extreme casual racism just, yeah just for some just for saying black people can't go to heaven wide, just that wide. just that you can't say anything these days pc mm. culture is out of control get your musket Then Elder Oaks said challengingly, I would like to hear a little more musket fire from this temple of learning. Holy shit, what an absurd statement. I mean, Elder Hon should really know the power of metaphor. As we've learned from the entire history of religion, Uh, you can't just say shit like that. (laughs) I think he's intentionally quoting Elder Oaks because he is like the legal architect of the church's um, stance on homosexuality. And in its continuing mission to legally disenfranchise gay people for no other reason than they don't like it okay this is actually getting really bad now okay i just i'm still stuck on this whole like musket i would like to hear more musket fire i think this, this is the line that everyone's really pissed at including myself because it's not like it's so reckless for a person who's who in charge of a church whose ranks are filled with like literal neo-nazis look at desnat on twitter like literally threatening violence and to say like we need a little bit more musket fire from this temple didn't jesus say whoever takes the musket dies by the musket or sword or whatever you want to do like what the hell is he talking about weapons of war just want to talk really quick about the mormon church's persecution complex like remember this is a 200 billion dollar organization with Mm -hmm. implicit control of utah state government uh largest private landowner in the state of florida like this isn't a my like a minority group this isn't a marginalized group nobody is out there hunting mormons nobody is coming at them with muskets so to draw up this old illusion of like we need people who are building the temple and defending us with muskets and we need to see a little more musket fire like what the hell are you talking about and of course he's drawing back to mormon's history of being persecuted by the angry mobs but when you look at the history you see that the mormon church like they weren't just this like oh we just wanted to practice our religion they hate us because we love jesus yeah it's like (laughs) no the church was Ag- like Mormons were aggravating people. Mm-hmm. If you haven't seen the coming the, into their towns and taking them over, like politically. seizing political power, Marrying seizing people's kids. lines, uh, seizing people's lands, and being like, "Sorry, God gave it to mm-hmm. us," and then um, carrying out just as violent uh, mobocracy on their neighbors. Like yep. when you when you dig into the to the history, you see that, and it's like, "Holy shit, we were not just the victims; they were the perpetrators." They would even kill people that left their own in group. Yeah, like. <laughs> um, so you like, were gonna mention Holy Hell though, which I do think is worth. Or I was uh, not Holy Hell. Yeah. Um, the docu series Wild Wild Country. Oh, Wild I love Wild it. Country, it's like my yeah. favorite cold doc because it parallels so perfectly yeah. mirrors the Mormon the Mormon position of these group of people who move to you know the the frontier and who are just like this is our place now. We run the show and they any take resistance over the local they just like they escalate the violence. They escalate the tension. They tried to, uh, the Mormons tried to assassinate Governor Boggs. So it's not like they're just like these, like, oh, poor little me, poor president. Yeah. They, it's like, they were doing <laughs> this shit. letter. <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh well, this is going to get worse because he said um, 
He's talking about defending BYU. From what? Let's find out. He said this in a way that could have applied to a host of topics in various departments, but the one he specifically mentioned was the doctrine of the family and defending marriage as the union of a man and a woman. There we go. Little did he know that while many would hear this appeal, his appeal, especially the school of family life, who moved quickly and visibly to assist, some others fired their muskets, all right, but unfortunately didn't always aim at those hostile to the church. A couple of stray rounds even went north of the point of the mountain. I can't believe he's making this gun metaphor. Shit, it's like hardly metaphoric at all when you consider like how <coughs> much actual room. gun violence is going on in America and how much actual violence is being threatened on queer people all the fucking time. This makes me so pissed. I spent all morning just being actually enraged by this. I can't believe that a man who claims to be an intellectual and well-read and all this mm -hmm. shit, like he knows what he's fucking doing. I'm so pissed. My beloved brothers and sisters, a house divided against itself cannot stand. And I will go to my grave pleading that this... In Here's the thing with that. Is like, the way that you deal with division and like, dissenting opinions is not by just like, forcing everyone to like, agree with you. It's by building tolerance for different opinions. Yes. Do you know what I mean? Um, just really quick. He's a couple of stray rounds even went north of the point of the mountain. He's saying that people were firing shots at Salt Lake City, at... Temple Square at the Brethren. And this is so stupid oh. because he's, he's saying they should have been shooting at critics of the church. at uh, But instead, they took uh, some shots at the school and some at even us. Like, nobody is shooting at you. Nobody is persecuting you. Nobody is trying to legally disenfranchise you. Nobody. But that's what you are doing to other people. Like, uh, that ContraPoints video, the J.K. Rowling one, I loved how she got into... You should watch ContraPoints if you haven't. So like, I don't amazing. even know why we're on YouTube when she's doing I, what yeah, she's I doing. Want, yeah. um, but she talks about bigotry and how, like, uh, so many people these days are like, bigotry, bigot is a slur. Yeah. And it's like, no, it's actually just a descriptor. And yeah. you meet the description. It's someone who's trying to legally disenfranchise marginalized people for mm -hmm. no other reason than you don't like them. Mm -hmm. And if you're doing that, if it, if it looks like a bigot, talks like a bigot, walks like a bigot, it's probably a bigot. And, that, and this is like the church, just again, this $200 billion organization who's like, oh, I'm a victim because some people are criticizing me on the internet. We should shoot at them. This is crazy. <laughs> It's insane, especially because, like, Mormonism is a religion that has historically bred religious fanaticism. I mean, the Danites, what did they do? Went around, like, killing people for leaving the church or, like, apostatizing, whatever. This is a church that, until, like, the 1900s, people going through the temple had to swear to seek out vengeance for the blood of Joseph Smith on the United States of America. Like, these aren't chill people. This isn't a chill history. You live in a country with tons of gun violence. Let's Your church is based in a country with more gun violence than any other country in the world. Uh, who is Who has been more subject to violence over the last hundred years? Members of the queer community or Mormons? Yeah. Let's just do a quick little search and find yeah. out. Um, also want to say the start, the very beginning of the Book of Mormon is a story about a guy who the spirit tells him to behead a defenseless drunk. Yeah. Like, this is crazy town. This for is some like... plates that weren't even ultimately used for anything <laughs> because he just put a fucking stone in the hat and then apparently he didn't do a good job of that because the church has had to rewrite the book many times and it was like decades or something where the, the Book of Mormon had an incorrect view of the Godhead and they had to like remove racism and it's just like, so what was the fucking point of that? <laughs> anyway, so he said a house against itself cannot stand. And I will go to my grave pleading that this institution not only stands but stands unquestionably committed, unquestionably, great word for a university, <laughs> committed to its unique academic mission and to the church that sponsors it. <laughs> the unique academic <laughs> mission, that is delegitimizing academia. <laughs> yeah, only using it insofar as it helps our aims. We hope it isn't a surprise to you that your trustees are not deaf or blind to the feelings that swirl around marriage and the whole same-sex topic on campus. <laughs> oh, just a topic that everyone's <laughs> chatting about. I and many of my brethren have spent more time and shed more tears on this subject than we could ever adequately convey to you this morning, or any morning. Everyone else close your eyes except for Jeffrey <clears throat> R. Holland. We have spent hours discussing what the doctrine of the church can and cannot provide the individuals and families struggling over this difficult issue. I fucking hate this. I hate this. Yeah. Because he's like, 
we get it. We understand. We lo- it's like We're that JK super Rowling thing. We're sad with you. We're I'm, so sad. Yeah, I it hurts me to know how bad my actions hurt you. This is like this is straight up it hurts textbook me that you would abuse. Take it this way. Like yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Like it hurts me. Ugh. This oh. is exactly what people in abusive relationships do where you like bring up something that's like you've done this thing to hurt me and they're like, wow, wow, I can't believe it. I can't believe you would bring this up right now. You are so hurtful. You hate me so much. You're so ungrateful. It's like they're not doing anything. This is the school where the president of the university got up and said, uh, two homosexuals at the university, just go home. We do not want you here. What year was that? This was like the 70s or something. Lovely. Um, And that like actually spied on queer people, like, like an insane, like paranoid crazy type like inserted microphones yeah. and shit and incentivized students to out gay people so that they could kick them out and like, did electroshock therapy long after it was proven to be ineffective right? yes let's switch our battery real quick so it is with scar tissue of our own that we are trying to avoid and hope all will try to avoid language symbols and situations that are more divisive than unifying at the very time we want to show love for all of God's children. Okay, first of all, it's not... Devi- You're creating <laughs> the divisiveness. You literally just said you need, want to hear more musket fire pointed at the queer community. Nothing and yet unifies we need to, like a healthy round of musket yeah, fire, though, am I right? Jesus Christ. The, like, I can't believe how someone can be so stupid. I and like hate to just to use language like that to say he's just stupid, but like, how can you say shit like that and then be like, we need to avoid language that's not so divisive? Like, what the hell? What the actual hell? You literally used a gun metaphor. <laughs> Scar tissue from what? From people saying, "Oh, people ouchie. disagreeing right? with you." Yeah, for like you don't want to scars. marry the people they love. If you're, if you have scars. And emotional pain from other people just living the lives, their lives the way they see fit. Like, you're an insane, like, narcissist. You need help. I don't know how you could, wouldn't be an insane narcissist when you are Jeffrey R. Holland standing up there, A, <laughs> claiming to be an apostle of God who gets, like, special insight. Has from, a second anointing. Yeah. Who, yeah, I mean, sin. let's not forget that these men have received their second anointing in which they are basically, aren't they told that nothing they could ever do will, um, affect their place in the celestial kingdom yeah they, like they are just sure. guaranteed they so they already see themselves in a way as like demi transcended yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? totally totally he's to- obviously talking about gay people mm-hmm. it, nothing's more unifying than accepting everyone no you're the one trying to divide you're the one trying to say that this message of unity and love and tolerance is like not good. Yeah. The iron is Again, so doing good. the exact opposite of anything Jesus said. Judge not that you be not judged. Like, love your enemies, those who persecute you. No one's persecuting the Mormon church, and they can't even pull that one off. This oh, God. Makes me so upset. Oh, it's gonna get worse. If a student, oh, God. If a student commandeers a graduation podium intended to represent underlined everyone getting diplomas in order to announce his personal sexual orientation, what might another speaker feel free to announce the next year until eventually anything goes? Okay, it's a lovely slippery slope fallacy. So he's obviously talking about, let me just double check his name. Um, It's Matt Easton, isn't it? Am I getting that right? Yeah, Matty Easton. So he's obviously talking about that, and like this has been pointed out on Twitter, but like that's punching down. <laughs> You're at the top of this organization. This was a kid who, like, your own church has spread the most horrifically cruel messages about people like Matty for decades. This university was like super involved in perpetuating discriminatory attitudes and practices against gay people. Still. And so a marginalized person used their platform to speak up for the gr- the marginalized group that they represent and you have an issue with that and you see that as divisive? <laughs> and also, what might another speaker feel free to announce the next year until anything goes? Like, what are you implying? <laughs> oh, are we going to just let pedophiles speak? And it's like, no, they already founded the church. <laughs> <laughs> they already had their bit. <laughs> they had a big moment of like a century and a half. <laughs> Okay, and, like, someone just talking about their personal experience, like, their lived experience is, again, is not an attack on you. Um, you like, this you is something that he, like, dealt with and still was the valedictorian of a university. Also, half of the 
this talk was just Jeffrey R. Holland being like, when I was seven, I saw the Y on the mountain. It's like, what might you say next? Like, <laughs> anything goes. Like, this boring ass story of you as a brainwashed seven year old. Like, how is it different? We draw on personal experiences to connect with others in things like graduation speeches. And oh. you do that shit all the time. Every talk you give is like about you in some like giant sense. He is just such a goddamn Pharisee. Such like a would be let's see Jesus being like, Oh, you're gonna you're gonna talk, you're gonna save women taken in adultery? What next? Like <laughs> It's just so stupid because the whole of the church is about straight people <laughs> that's all it is and he's like someone talking about his personal sexual orientation in a speech that's supposed to be for everyone it's like how do you think gay people feel every time you talk every time, every time you're like i'm so talks. glad i'm straight so i can have my eternal family yeah god that's the whole fucking church experience what might commencement come to mean or not mean <laughs> if we push individual license over institutional dignity for very long? Yeah, that's Again, very Jesus, isn't it? Implying that the lived experience of being gay is indignified, undignified. Do we simply end up with more divisiveness in our culture than we already have? And we already have too much everywhere. People, it's not its not divisive to be gay, to talk about being gay. It's just being a thing. It's diversity. But of course, this is coming from an institution, an organization of, with people like Elder Oaks, who he so admirably quoted, who are like, diversity is bad. We don't <laughs> want it. Like, he literally straight up said that the other day. Like, diversity, no good. That's not what Jesus is about. It's like, I'm on crazy pills. This is crazy. In that spirit. <laughs> mm, loved that spirit for you. <laughs> Let me go no farther before before declaring unequivocally. He used the incorrect. It should be further. In that spirit, let me go no farther before declaring unequivocally my love and that of my brethren for those who live with this same sex challenge and so much complexity that challenge. goes with it. You are the literal challenge. You're the reason why it's hard to be gay a gay Mormon. Like, if it weren't for people like you, it wouldn't be a challenge. It would just be fine. People could just be themselves and not have an issue. It's not that complex that, like, a man wants to have sex with a man or marry a man. Like, it's really not that complex. It's very simple. You understand it very well. And that doesn't affect you in any way. There's... In any way. Please, read the next sentence. I'm, I'm just, excited. I'm just like, how can you say you love someone and not offer any action that validates that statement. You don't love someone if you don't do anything to show that to them. Just saying it. Yeah. Too often, the world has been unkind in many instances, crushingly cruel From to the these our brothers LDS and General sisters. General Conference talks. Oh my God, like you, just now. You're being Literally crushingly... two minutes ago. <laughs> it's, oh, it's, okay. So like this whole thing of like, we love them so much. We have so much scar tissue. We have shed just as many tears as them. He's believing in like this caricature of what it means to be bad and to be cruel it's like the 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 biggest cruelty that has happened throughout history is not the overt stuff you don't have to stand at a pul pulpit and say i hate gay people to be crushingly cruel mm -hmm. like it's crushingly cruel to deny gay people the right to love who they love or you know what i mean mm -hmm. to like get an education when they want to get an education like cruelty is like often a lot more insidious but in their mind because they stand there and say we love them even though then all their actions and other things they say about these people like are in opposition to that they they somehow feel like they can maintain the this idea that they're the good guys mm. but it's like the bad guys never think they're the bad guys that's that's how it goes if if what the LDS church has been to gay people is not crushingly cruel then like truly what is i mean i <laughs> guess like you know killing him on the spot in syria that's worse yeah. sure there's a spectrum but it's like and yet the LDS leaders have said that homosexuality is a sin next to murder and that the consequence should be death. Like that has been said and at said the worse pulpit. And they've said that as well. They've said so many crushingly cruel things. That, that leads to a perfect, another contrapoint um, when she talks about Nazi Germany. And, the, you know, like we think, okay, what's a worse, what's a perfect example of like a truly bigoted people? And it's like Nazi Germany, they hated Jews. But... In, even in Nazi Germany, they weren't like, we hate Jews. Mm -hmm. That's never what they say. That's not how bigotry we're like, works. We're just concerned about the how much influence Jews are having on our economics and how how prominent they are in these spaces and how overrepresented they are in these spaces. Yeah, it's the, it's the people in power, like the LDS Church, a power structure, um, who take a victim stance and say, 
we are the ones being hurt by the Jews, by the gays, which, you know, Nazi Germany also was prejudiced against gay people, also set them to the death camps. And again, because it wasn't because they hated them, it was because they were defending the national values. They were defending their heritage, their tradition, their beliefs. And it wasn't seen as this like, oh, we're, we're evil, we hate them. It's like, we're, yeah. Which is exactly what Elder Holland's doing, acting like he's the victim yeah. when literally nothing has been done against him, when literally he has the power. Well, this is so classic because the best way to justify cruelty against a marginalized group is to set yourself up as a victim of them, which yeah. is what the Nazis did with the Jews. And it's what he's doing in this talk. He's essentially implying that he's being persecuted. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like he's talked about how like he has so much scar tissue and we need to defend ourselves. And like the implication of like, we need to take our muskets up and defend ourselves is the idea that we're being attacked. You're not being attacked. No, you, people are just trying to live their lives without you getting in the way. People are starting to defend themselves against your attacks. And that feels like an attack to you because you have held this powerful position where people don't question you for so long and you've got away with your crushing cruelty for so long but it will assist everyone in providing such help if things can be kept in some proportion and balance in the process for example we have to be careful that love and empathy do not get interpreted as condoning and advocacy that was something that Jesus was really worried about. You know, when he... Uh, it's like, don't give too much empathy because it can be taken the wrong way. Yeah, people might think that you actually endorse the publicans and sinners when you hang out around them. Mm -hmm. Or that orthodoxy and loyalty to principle not be interpreted as unkindness or disloyalty to people. If, if the principle is unkind, then yeah, you are being unkind. As near as I can tell, Christ never once withheld his love from anyone, but he also never once said to anyone... Because I love you, you are exempt from keeping my commandments. Again, you also didn't say anything about gay people. <laughs> yeah, it's like not a word. Um, uh, the Pharisee said, Moses in the law commanded that such should be stoned. And Jesus said, uh, whomsoever among you be without sin, let him first fire the first musket. Like that's what Je that was what Jesus was about. And you're saying, <laughs> I love you, but is never a good look. No. Also, like, the Mormon vision of freedom and liberty is so superficial and <clears throat> stupid. They Like, to them, liberty means I get to tell everybody else how to live. Yeah. It's like, that's not how liberty works. That's not yeah. how a free society works. Like, it is important to have a, a secular society so that everyone can live their religious or non-religious life without being trammeled and imposed on by certain religious factions. Like Mormons, you know, so rife with uh, Islamophobia. Oh, Sharia law. If we have Muslims coming here, they'll try to impose Sharia law. And it's like, what, are you afraid they beat you to it? Because that's what you're trying to do. Like, you have this vision where, like, no one is allowed to be gay. Where no one's allowed to get married if they're gay. And it's like, this, we live in a secular society where we have to protect the rights of those people to, like, to, to self-actualize, to self-determine. It's just so mind-boggling. And it's obviously because he comes from this place of like, yeah, but our things that we believe come from God. And it's like, everyone, everyone that. believes everyone that. Everyone thinks that. That's why Osama we have to Bin figure Laden out. What, yeah, that. exactly. We are tasked with trying to strike that same sensitive, demanding balance in our lives. It shouldn't feel like a fucking struggle to like <laughs> strike a balance of how much love and empathy you can show. <laughs> Musket fire? Yes, we will always need defenders of the faith. But friendly fire is a tragedy. And from time to time, the church, its leaders, and some of our colleagues within the university community have taken such fire on this campus. And sometimes it isn't friendly, wounding students and the parents of students who are confused about what so much recent flag waving and parade holding on this issue means. Oh, poor homophobic parents are so confused about why BYU is not being as homophobic as it used to be. <laughs> There are better ways to move toward crucially important goals in these very difficult matters. Okay, first of all, you don't... What, like, <laughs> crucially important goals? We're not... These groups aren't aligned on what the goals are. Your goal is to continue legally disenfranchising gay people and their goal is to liberate themselves from your oppression. Mm -hmm. Ways that show empathy and understanding for everyone while maintaining loyalty to prophetic leadership and devotion to revealed doctrine. You don't have full empathy and understanding for people, or you wouldn't act like this. Like, if you truly understood the no. impact it has on gay people, and if you truly understood, like, the reality of the situation and what is and isn't possible for these people... 
He knows what it's like. He was wounded by all the parading and flag waving. That is wounding him. <laughs> Understanding doesn't just Tip mean like, tat. yeah, it seems really hard to be gay. Like there's <laughs> his, he has such a shallow understanding and such a shallow empathy for gay people, but then also feels equipped to tell them how to live, to tell mm. them like to be celibate their whole lives, to tell them to not love who they love. For again, in the beginning of the talk, he's like, we got, you know, this is rooted in our past. And again, if you go back like 30 years, this same kind of discourse was going on against like about yep. black people, yep. about the interracial question. We must never let interracial marriage happen. This is what God intended. And we know that it's hard to be black in this church and not exactly know where you fit in and being we told that you can only go to the celestial kingdom as a slave. But... We can't, sh you know, shirk the word of the Lord on this issue. I have so much empathy. I get it. I feel so bad. I, I, cry, I cry tears at night because I'm wounded by how much you want to just be treated like a normal person. But unfortunately, I can't do that. That would be t having too much empathy. My brethren have made the case for the metaphor of musket fire, which I have endorsed yet again today. Just fuck off with this musket C fire just shit. Just consider a different metaphor. God, do the homophobia with a different metaphor that will maybe lead to a little bit less gunfire. <laughs> there will continue to be those who oppose our teachings, and with that will continue the need to define, document, and defend the faith. Yeah, keep documenting it. That will do well yeah. for you. Keep excommunicating all your historians who are publishing the church... The True docu like true history of the church. That also, great. please keep defining the faith because I love having to watch you unravel that. But we do all look forward to the day when we can beat our swords into plowshares and our spears into pruning hooks. And at least on this subject, learn war no more. What the fuck are you talking about? How can you how can you say, oh yeah, I, I like this metaphor, I stand by it. Though someday I hope that I won't have to shoot at you. I really One day you'll all just like be bullied into submission. I believe in the someday we'll see the perfect Advent day when there are no more gay people that we have to shoot at. <laughs> won't that be great? Well, this is him trying to listen to this. And while I have focused on this same sex topic this morning more than I would have liked... If you would have liked to have focused on it less, then focus on it less. Like what? You just like God told you to? Is that the implication there? I pray you will see it as emblematic of a lot of issues our students and community face in this complex, contemporary world of ours. The, the current moment of the world is always contemporary. <laughs> but I digress. Back to the blessings of a school in Zion. Okay, one of Can't my favorite tweets about this was like, um, shits on gay people for all this time. But I digress. Back to me. <laughs> Back to us. Uh, do you see the beautiful parallel between the unfolding of the restoration and the prophetic development of BYU? No. <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> Notwithstanding that both will have critics along the way. Like it's the so cute when they think that like eventually this stuff will clear up. And uh -huh. It's just like, we're just in a moment right now. Yes, it's like, someday mm -hmm. the evidence is going to come out. It's, it's like going to undo all the billions of evidences against the church. Then we'll have our laugh. <sighs> like the church itself... BYU Idaho Provo has grown in spiritual strength <laughs> and the it? number of people it reaches and serves and its unique place among other institutions of higher education. It has grown in national and international reputation. It'd be so funny <laughs> if the consequence of this talk is like them getting threatened by like the sports board. Oh yeah. Cause you know, how long can BYU football continue being accredited is it by the NCAA is it <laughs> when they're this homophobic I don't know anything about sports every time I, just, I try to talk about I it I googled like, the NCAA know. today that's all I know more and more of its faculty are distinguishing themselves and even more importantly so are more and more of its students yeah on the Mormon Stories podcast <laughs> <laughs> reinforcing the fact that so many do understand exactly what that unfolding of dream of BYU is not long ago one of your number wrote to me the mar this marvelous description of what he thought was the call to those who serve at BYU okay so now we're going to just hear from one like random student who wrote like a horny letter to Elder Holland how dare they share their personal experiences for using this letter I know seriously this is supposed to be a letter for everyone yeah the Lord's call to those of us who serve at BYU is a call to create learning experiences of unprecedented depth oh, yeah. <laughs> quality and impact <laughs> As good as BYU is and has been, this is a call to do better. 
It is a call to educate many more students, to more effectively help them become true disciples of Jesus Christ, to prepare them to lead in their families, in the church, in their professions, and in a world filled with commotion. By not doing any of the things (laughs) that Jesus recommended in the Bible. But answering this call cannot be done successfully without his help, I believe, the writer concludes. That help will come according to the faith and obedience of the tremendously good people of BYU. I agree enthusiastically with such a sense of calling here, and with that reference to and confidence in the tremendously good people of BYU. Let me underscore that idea of such a call by returning to President Kimball's second century address. Must we, Jeffrey? (laughs) (laughs) Mm. President Kimball, one of our favorite racist homophobes. (laughs) Seriously. He's really going to have to make your case. It's just him circle jerking every name that's ever attended BYU. When you look at President Kimball's talk again, a copy of which will be distributed following this conference, may I ask you to pay particular attention to that sweet prophet's effort to ask that we be unique. In his discourse, President Kimball used the word unique eight times and special eight times. Yes, Mormon superiority complex, we know. (laughs) I love how it's like being unique and special in all the wrong ways because Mormonism has tried... Uniquely homophobic. It started out as this whole like, fuck the United States government, we're doing our own thing and if they want to fucking party, we'll blind them up. (laughs) And now they're like, we are just the most white bread stale, bland, homogenous culture that you can imagine. And we're really trying to set ourselves apart as being more homophobic than everybody else. This is a great look. In his discourse, it seems clear to me in my 73 years of loving it that BYU will become an educational Mount Everest. (laughs) What, people can't breathe on it? (laughs) And people like are struggling to get to the top, like, to get to the end of their degree because, like, by their fucking junior year, they've all apostatized. Only rich people can go? (laughs) Only to the degree that it embraces its uniqueness, its singularity, its lack of diversity. (laughs) We could mimic every other university in the world until we got a bloody nose. We could not be homophobic, but that would would kind of kill our vibe. This is, like, our unique selling point, so we really need to run with it. Uh, We got a bloody nose in the effort, and the world would still say, BYU who? (laughs) No, we must have the will to stand alone if necessary. Being a university second to none in its role primarily as an undergraduate teaching institution that is unequivocally true to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ in the process. Yeah, because every other Christian university is not into that. You guys are the, you're the ones, the only no Christians one out there. No one else thinks they're being true to the gospel of Jesus Christ. If at a future time that mission means foregoing some professional affiliations and certifications, then so <laughs> They're predicting be it. it. He fucking knows. He's like, we can't keep being this homophobic and remain in good standing with all these like national boards. They always buckle. They're going to buckle. This is not going to age well. But they'll strike it from the record like they always yeah. do. It's great. There may come a day when the price we are asked to pay for such association is simply too high, too inconsistent with who we are. Blatant homophobes. No one wants it to come to that. But if it does, we will pursue our own destiny. A destiny that is not a matter of chance, but largely a matter of choice. Not a thing to be waited for, but a thing to be envisioned and achieved. Mom, what is that big Y on the mountain? It stands for the university here in Provo. Brigham Young University. Named after the West's most famous racist. (laughs) Well, it must be the greatest university in the world. Again, named after one of the greatest racists in the West. And so, for Jeff Holland, it is. To help you pursue that destiny in the only real way I know how to help. Homophobia. I leave an (laughs) apostolic blessing on every one of you as you start another school year. Remember when they used to give us apostolic blessings at BYU-Idaho? Oh, yeah. I never really felt like they did anything, but I really wanted to believe that they did. Yeah, I was like, oh my God. I got special pixie dust. (laughs) In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and with gratitude for his holy priesthood, I bless you personally. Bless the students who will come under your influence and bless the university as a campus-wide endeavor. I bless you that profound personal faith will be your watchword and the unending blessings of personal rectitude will be your eternal reward. I bless your professional work that it will be admired by your peers. Oh, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) And I bless your devotion to gospel truths that it will be the saving graces in some student's life. 
funny how many uh, students have talked about how these teachers who are so-called radicalizing students, the ones who just like have enough empathy to be like, I'm so sorry, I love you and support you no matter what. This, those are the ones who are saving lives. Not the People ones who are like, that. sorry, I'm just going to keep standing on like the, the institutional line of pure ass homophobia. The sound was corrupted on the rest of this video, so it's just going to be the camera audio now, which is not terrible, but just to explain that. They're not the ones who are saving lives. I bless your families that those you hope will be faithful in keeping their covenants will be saved, at least in part, because you have been faithful in keeping yours. Hell yeah! Fucking stop it. Free ride, baby! <laughs> <laughs> the te tentacles of divine providence will reach after me, and I'll say, ooh, I love tentacles. Light conquers darkness. Truth triumphs against error. Goodness is victorious over evil in the end. Let's hope so. <laughs> I bless each one of you with every righteous desire of your heart. And thank you for giving your love and loyalty to BYU. Please, from one who owes so much to this school and has loved her so deeply for oh, so long. Oh, BYU got a gender now. Very surprising that BYU would be a woman. But maybe it's just like, you know, it's an object, so. <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> uh, keep her not only standing, but standing for what she uniquely and prophetically was meant to be. <laughs> keep your woman in line. May the rest of higher education see your good works and glorify our Father which is in heaven. Boom. Accreditation. Gone. <laughs> that this was is a, fucking a bad look. I really just feel like even if they want to keep doing the homophobia, maybe don't focus too much on how much you're keeping <laughs> the homophobia. Like maybe like offer something else. It's kind of one of those things where like once you get to the point where you're kind of like only offering like a talks about your enemies. You're never actually focusing on like the stuff you claim to be into. Uh, Do you know what I mean? It's just like all you're doing is criticizing. You're not actually offering anything. I how off for how often the church is like does some just like poo brain thing <laughs> and is like our our critics in the media are always targeting us and it's like Maybe if you just stop doing poo brain things for once, maybe twice, people wouldn't, <laughs> you wouldn't stay the laughing stock of America. Like, it's all yeah. the time they're doing this kind of shit. It's interesting seeing that they are doubling down on this and they're like, we are willing to lose our accreditation. We are willing to get as niche and alienated from the rest of the world as we need to be because for so long they were just desperately trying to be accepted by the world and. I wonder if they have enough money at this point to pull it off. Because, like, people are leaving yeah. the church in droves, um, but it is getting richer through their investment schemes. Yeah. So I wonder if there will actually come a point where they're like, fuck it, we're doing our own thing. Yeah. Because um, they just, like, don't need the external revenue so much. It's such a dead dream now, the idea that the church is just going to keep growing. Like, they all know it, right? Yeah. So at this point, they're just trying to, like, re-entrench. I mean, it's, it's just so classic. Like, watching the... The demise of Mormonism is just like, it's textbook, isn't it? Textbook. And it's so textbook to be so obsessively focused on your perceived enemies and like to continue to make yourself a victim of these like marginalized groups. Like it's just all so classic. It's boring. It's like, do something more original. <laughs> You're not brave for like remaining faithful to your brainwashing that you got when you were like seven years old or you know, three years old, whatever. You're not brave for like continuing to oppress gay people. Uh, and a, a marginalized community that just wants equal rights, making them the punching bag of your like whole apocalyptic mission. Wow, awesome, Being great like, religion. We must teach the gospel of Jesus Christ more better than anyone else, and then you're like, be careful on the love and empathy. <laughs> Don't be too indulgent with it. Yeah. Cool. Oh yeah. Already, already. already. There was a, a tweet from. Uh, there was a picture in a seminary class. It yes. was like LGBTQIA students welcome and had the, the flag and just saying that they're welcome someone was which like, isn't even saying like it's okay to practice it which is you know the church still thing like it's okay to be gay you just don't practice it or it used to be it's not okay to be gay but. and the caption was the world is too much with it and then someone else shared it and was like time to get the muskets the church has a real issue right now with an ever growing ever more violent like splinter Fashion, off yeah of Desnat people who are like ready to go to war, who are violent, who like want to hurt gay people already and do. And it's like they don't address any of that. They just get, it's this of is just not, because they than... agree. That's the thing is they agree. Yeah. They're saying yeah. the the most kind 
things yeah. that they can imagine saying. What they're saying in private yeah. and feeling in private is way worse than this. This is just the Mormon equivalent of Trump being like, stand by, proud boys. Yeah. Like, how is it any different? Yeah. If you wanna support the channel, help us have more time to make videos shitting on this nonsense, you can support us on Patreon, we'll do bonus videos. Thanks for watching. Sorry this was such a doozy. Sorry yeah. to uh, the queer people who are having to go through this, especially current students at BYU. That would be so, like, genuinely scary. I feel yeah. scared in yeah. Utah. I've had, like, in downtown Salt Lake, I've had people yell faggot at me, and, like, it's not cool knowing that the people who run the state uh -huh. here are, like, inciting this kind of behavior. It's kind Just of, it's really awareness. scary. And I, being a, a student at BYU and, like, with this kind of climate would be just terrifying. So our hearts go out to you. Um, you're loved and as soon as you can, get the hell out of there because it's not changing. They're not trying to make it a safe space for gay people. And I feel like, like, I do feel like BYU has got a lot more progressive, but I just feel like the leadership of the church is just, I mean, we've seen this with plenty of high demand religions and cults, like losing their power and influence over members. Like they start getting more and more unhinged. Mm -hmm. And taking and they, it out on more and more marginalized Yeah, and feeling more like victims and like crying all the time about how persecuted they are. Do you really think anything good's gonna come from this? Except for people who are already really like entrenched and radicalized, feeling more emboldened to be mean and potentially violent? Because again, that's kind of what they want. He yeah. wants that, remember his like, his ideal where there isn't any diversity or, yeah. or contradiction. Like they want a world where gay people don't feel safe being out, where gay people aren't allowed to be proud of who they are, where they're not allowed to have to participate in society. Mm -hmm. That's the problem. This makes me so fucking sad. I've just been like, like I said, just so sad all morning knowing, knowing that like my family is entangled in this, mm -hmm. that they look at like, I mean, I'm sure if I was like, hey, I'm pansexual, is that, a, you know, like that would hurt them and they're they're caught up in all these like, homophobic narratives about how other people just living their lives is trying to ruin theirs and it's like what a child absolutely childish thing and it's just like well that's it my family is stuck in this the state of utah is run by this fuck love you all <sighs> okay let's be done with this thanks for watching hope you have a better day goodbye